say, gee, I heard it here. Uh, it's, it's, it's because, because it's a big topic, and uh, the folks around here in your group have really been doing great work, Vince and others. And uh, we are looking forward to learning about um, what this means for us in terms of metagenomics and uh, the kinds of thinking that we have to develop to understand how hosts and pathogens interact with uh, each other in health and disease. So thanks for being here, Pat. We're very appreciative of you being in our seminar series. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that great introduction. I hope I can live up to it in the next 50 years, um, <laughs> if I'm here. <laughs> um, but it, it, uh, it's always an honor to be able to uh, give a talk uh, to colleagues and students that um, are, I guess, normally encouraged to you know, suck up to you. And so I, I look forward to you all interrogating me, um, kind of the opposite of a prelim exam here. Um, but what I want to share with you today is a lot of the, th some of the thinking that goes on in my head when I think about the microbiome. And um, Brian didn't mention is that I come at this as an engineer by training and that I received all my degrees in biological engineering. I've taken all of two microbiology classes in my life and somehow I wound up in a med school in a department that has immunology in the title, and I've only made it about 30 pages into Janeway's immunology. Um, so don't tell the people that across the street. So I come at it from a more of an environmental perspective and seeing the gut microbiome as a microbial ecology problem. And sometimes I feel a little bit sheepish about people pointing out that I'm involved with the microbiome because that's really only one component of microbial ecology research among many other larger things going on in the world right now. Uh, that have to do with deep sequencing of microbial communities. And so the one that gets us our money here um, in my lab is looking at the human body and the communities associated with the host. Uh, the human body is made up of about 10 to the 15 microbial cells distributed among 100 to 1,000 thousands of species. Um, you, are, you are really a scaffold for microbes, microbial life. Um, and uh, thinking about soil, when I did my postdoc, I did a lot of work in soils. Uh, that this, you know, a gram of soil contains about 10 to the 9 cells per gram. It should be among thousands to tens of thousands of species. Most of our antibiotics and small molecules uh, come from bugs that love living in the soil or coming from the ocean where there's perhaps 100,000 to a million cells per mil. And perhaps lower richness in order of 100 to 1,000 of species per mil. Um, and all these environments are important, and we can perhaps mock um, the people on either side of the road, depending on our, our side of the road. Um, but you know, it's, it's clear that microbes drive a lot of the biogeochemical bio, uh, process in the world. Um, I was at a meeting a couple weeks ago, uh, hosted by the Moore Foundation, where they're thinking about climate models and how we can incorporate what's going on with the microbial ecology of the ocean into understanding what's happening with climate change. So this is, like I said, a big area of research. It's not just the human microbiome, uh, but for better or worse, we get a lot of the attention right, right now. <laughs> uh, and so it's good to be a part of that. So inspiration for me comes from when I was a grad student uh, looking at compost bioreactors and thinking about the dynamics of populations there. And I remember opening up an issue of applied environmental microbiology nearly 14 years ago when this came out, and a paper out of Jim TG's lab up the, up the road at MSU I was looking at bio, biomass reactors uh, converting a feedstock into um, uh, methane and removing carbon oxygen uh, demand and changes in pH. And basically what they saw was that over the course of 800 days, two or three years, um, my students think they have it bad because they have to track a mouse for 70 days. Um, this would be painful. Uh, but basically tracking these bioreactors and the process performance were pretty, pretty common, pretty uh, consistent across time. But when you looked at the breakdown of the taxonomic composition among the archaea, which were a dominant um, group of organisms within these bioreactors, there's a huge shift that occurred between about 1,300 and 1,400 days into the reactor, right about here. And as you can see, the, the process dynamics didn't change. And so this is something that's always intrigued me. And how can you have the names of the bugs, the genes of the bugs that are present in the community radically change, yet the phenotype um, remains consistent? And the more I learned, the more I realized that you know, this room is essentially an example of that. That if we were to take a gut sample from everybody in this room and, and compare them to each other, we would not find any species that was found in everybody in this room. Yet, 
as far as I can tell, check your neighbor, uh, everybody in the room has a pulse um, and has, I think, you know, for the most part, normal bodily function. Um, and, and so that's interesting. You can have very different taxonomic composition, but very similar functional um, stability or functional composition. And so um, when I was at previously at University of Massachusetts, um, the NIH announced this roadmap initiative called the Human Microbiome Project. It was everyone's favorite gal, HMP gal, HMP girl, uh, where they sampled as part of a large effort uh, 18 body sites from about 300 people uh, at two or three time points over two, two or three years. And so we, we had a big hand in coordinating this analysis, and now a postdoc in my lab, Tao Ding, uh, is working with us to characterize the dynamics of these communities in these 300 individuals over two or three time points. And so two or three time points, uh, I will not argue, is a lot of time points. Um, but for microbiome research, getting 300 people to uh, give you bodily sam samples at 18 body sites at all is, is hard. Uh, and so this is, a, for all its warts and flaws, was a massive undertaking to understand the dynamics and composition of normal microbiome function. And so I always like to show this quote, and by now I think many people that have heard me talk uh, have seen this quote because I always use it. Uh, but this is from a, what I consider a father of microbiome research. Uh, and he was interested in what causes diarrhea in children uh, in his pediatrics um, practice. So he says, it would appear to be a pointless and doubtful exercise to examine and disentangle the apparently random appear appearing bacteria in normal feces in the intestinal tract, a situation that seems controlled by a thousand coincidences. Anybody that's done anything with microbial communities could say, here, here, <laughs> let's go home now, let's go to the bar. Yet I have nevertheless devoted myself now for a year, a whole year, this is like exasperated already, virtually exclusively to this special study. It was the conviction that the accurate knowledge of these conditions is essential to the understanding of not only the physiology of digestion, but also the pathology and therapy of microbial intestinal diseases. It comes from our good friend Theodore Escherich back in 1885. Um, Vince Young and I actually um, were, were looking at the first issue of J. Back back in 1916, Journal of Bacteriology, and wouldn't you know that two of the six papers had something to do with the microbiome. So this is not a new question, right? Um, and people were thinking about it and worrying about it uh, way back in 1885, and of course the bug he found, he didn't call Escherichia coli, but that's the bug he found, is Escherichia coli. Um, and so you can fast forward 130 years and think about what do we know now that you know, Dr. Escherich didn't know? You know, he didn't have, you know, Darwin had just published Origin of Species. Mendel had just you know, had all his results burned by his brother Monks and released all this stuff on genetics. Um, didn't know any, Fisher hadn't done statistics. Uh, we didn't know that most bugs couldn't be cultured. Didn't know that E. coli is actually in everybody's gut here, um, or you can't produce vital, you know, vitamins. And so if we want to move, we've got to, I think, leverage uh, these different disciplines and things we know about. And one of the reasons that I came to the University of Michigan was because uh, they had a cluster hire for microbial ecology where they're hiring people in a very interdisciplinary area, an interdisciplinary way. And so looking at clinicians who understand the problems. You, know, you can go to lunch with uh, Dr. Young and Dr. Loring and they'll tell you all sorts of crazy things about patients they saw that day or that week and you know how we don't have a clue what they're doing. Somebody, a physician who won't be named, sent me an email about doctors giving uh, milk and molassa eno molasses enemas today, right? So if you think we're in the year 2013 that we've got really sophisticated medical treatment, well, what effect does that have on C. diff in our hospital? I don't know, good question. Um, so they've got interesting questions, to say the least, uh, and access to lots of, lots of poop samples. Uh, epidemiologists who understand how to design experiments and do something with this clinical data. Uh, microbial ecologists. Um, you know, talking with people like Don Zak, um, Vincent Neff, Melissa Duhame, our friends in EEB, who understand things from an ecological perspective um, and leveraging the great microbial ecology methods we have to solve our different problems. Um, I always like to beat on the production sequencing facilities, but we need somebody to generate all this data and to keep pushing the technology. And then bioinformatics, we're generating tons of data. Uh, my lab recently bought a MySeq Illumina sequencer, which is a, a small sequencer. 
and currently it's churning out 10 million sequence reads. Um, you know, 10 years ago, that would have been unheard of by an assistant professor to have a you know, sequencer that could generate that much data in one day. And then what do we do with it all? And so one of the things that we tend to do in the Human Microbiome Project is make parallels to the Human Genome Project. And since this is a bioinformatics-ish seminar, uh, one of the things that I think is important to note is that for the Human Genome Project to have succeeded, it really needed to have great computational tools. So the development of assemblers for shotgun sequencing, which if you remember Titus Brown's talk from a couple months ago, um, you learned that we're breaking those, those assemblers now and trying to figure out how to get them to work again. Uh, database tools like BLAST and FASTA, and then a lot of phylogenetic tools. So a lot of the computational tools that we use for the Human Microbiome Project are still relatively crude and not always validated for what we're doing. Another thing that I think is important to consider is that um, Um, so I took this slide out accidentally that one of the things that, to their credit, that NHGRI did was to sequence a num number of model organisms. They'd sequence things like E. coli, C. elegans. Why? I mean, what does C. elegans have to do with human health? Maybe it's worms, I don't know. But, but the genes that those bugs, those organisms have will tell us a lot about the genes in the human genome. And so a lot of model organisms uh, that have educated our knowledge of genomics and unfortunately, at least the first version of the Human Microbiome Project ignored a lot of these model systems, looking at things like mice or um, insects or other model organisms, or even going back to C. elegans or Drosophila. And so we also need ecological tools to advance the Human Microbiome Project. Because we are ultimately just, we are dealing with ecology. Um, the, the sequencing centers look at this problem of characterizing microbial communities and say, well, we just sequence enough, we'll eventually get the right answer. Uh, you know, it, it's just a big circle, right, like a bacterial genome. And that's not the case. That we really have to think about key concepts of diversity and stability, uh, succession and response to disturbances, biogeography, niche partitioning. Uh, there's a paper that came out um, early on in the phase of next-gen sequencing looking at the colonization of the infant intestinal tract, which you would think would have lots of ramifications for things like succession or perturbations due to antibiotics. Yet, in the paper, did not mention the word succession, disturbance, perturbations at all. It was void of any kind of uh, ecology discussion. Yet, I would argue that if we want to understand these things, um, if we want to understand better things like disease and whatnot, I got it to work though. Um, that we need to understand things about biogeography. Why do we see certain bugs in certain places? Why does everybody in this room have a different gut community? Um, what are they doing there? How are they partitioning various niches? So ecologists are lucky in that they can, you know, they can go after these cute fuzzy animals and pull them out or put them into a community and see what happens. Um, we have a harder time with that. Uh, Alex Schubert in my lab is doing this um, along with a number of people in Vince Young's lab trying to understand if we perturb the communities with antibiotics, what effect does that then have on the stability of the system as measured by colonization by pathogens like Clostridium difficile? Um, ecologists also have the ability to put radio colors on animals so we can track where they go. Well, you know, we have to think perhaps what is the analogy for us? Uh, they also have a lot of mathematical models and statistical tools that they have been developing. And so, to emphasize this, I think ecology is really a, the prism by which we can better understand uh, the microbiome or any microbial community. So my favorite example of this is Yellowstone, uh, which if you consider yourself a microbiologist and you've never been to Yellowstone, you're not a real microbiologist. Um, it's just a wonderland for um, macro and microecology. But what they, they did about 15 years ago was to reintroduce the gray wolf and basically then watch what happened. So 100 years ago, they removed the gray wolf because they are annoying uh, shepherds uh, and livestock producers surrounding the park. Um, and this had certain effects. And then they brought the wolves back in and had other effects. And so it's been very interesting to see, you know, not only are they taking down uh, the elk, but they're also affecting the beavers in the stream and the fish and everything else that's going on in the park. And so just like if 
know, Alex gives her mice antibiotics. Um, not only does it perhaps affect one bug, but that has then all sorts of secondary and tertiary effects on all sorts of other bugs that then has an impact on colonization resistance. And so what are the radio collars that we use as microbial ecologists? So we have two tools that we like to use, um, 16S ribosomal RNA gene and shotgun sequencing. So by this approach with 16S, we are amplifying the 16S gene, which everybody from E. coli to humans have uh, some homolog of. It has, it's a taxonomic marker that's essential for ribosome function. It's ubiquitous. Uh, be even before next-gen sequencing, the most, uh, most abundant gene in GenBank was the 16S gene. It has low horizontal gene transfer rates. It's easy to PCR. Unfortunately, it provides us with very little taxonomic information. Shotgun sequencing um, will tell us something about the functions that are present. Um, and there's, considering there's a growing number of genome sequences out there as references, it's telling us a lot more about what's going on out in or inside our guts uh, at, a, at a functional level. And the shotgun sequencing has evolved from looking at uh, DNA to RNA to uh, protein sequences and even to metabolites that uh, the host and the microbes are producing. So this is a, a time of rapid change, um, lots of uncharted waters, lots of application of methods and techniques without really knowing what the hell we're doing. Um, and so that's what makes it fun and good opportunity for students and postdocs to move forward. So the technological landscape that we have, looking at the crowd, I know this is redundant for most of you, um, but you know, up until recently, 454 titanium sequencing has really been the workhorse for Amplicon work. Um, by Illumina standards, it's relatively expensive, but still much, much cheaper than Sanger sequencing. Uh, Illumina sequencing is the workhorse for metagenomics. Uh, it's starting to become uh, more widely used for Amplicon work. Um, and what it does is it generates tons, as in millions or tens of millions, of short reads that are perhaps 100 to 250 bases. Whereas 454 can perhaps get you a million sequences uh, in the, the as I say, four to 500 base read, read, um, length range. And there's other platforms like PacBio and IonTorrent that are coming on. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that there's a lot of hype out there. And so I often get people say to me, you know, what platform should I use to sequence whatever? Um, you know, I heard, went to this conference and I heard about this great new technology. Should I just wait to do it? Well, everything's moving so fast um, that you really don't have to worry. And, and really what's important um, are the questions. And so um, this is one of my final bioinformatics slides. But um, I, I actually got an email that relates to this today where a postdoc in our department um, partnered with a local biotech company to sequence a couple of bacterial genomes. And she has all this great data. And now she wants to know, well, how do I assemble it and call genes and do annotations and whatnot? Right? So it's a piece of cake to get the genome. Probably didn't even cost her a thousand bucks. It cost her a hundred bucks. And now what do I do, right? And so this is a problem that we often find ourselves. And so I tell students in my lab as they're coming in um, that if you were to get a PhD in history or um, literature, you would probably, before you could pass prelims, you know, qualify in several foreign languages. In my lab, uh, we have a language requirement. You have to learn some type of programming language. And that's not that I sit you down and say, you will master Perl or Python or C++. But just you get to a point where you hit a wall and you say, wow, I have now 10 million sequences. What do I do with them? And I say, whatever you can. Um, and so people have to learn this tool. So for students and postdocs, I really can't overemphasize uh, the need for knowledge of genomics and, uh, and some method, whether it's you know, some type of programming or database knowledge, to um, you know, really make these uh, data sets tractable. Because the data sets are not going to be getting smaller. Right? We have, in our department, people doing classical bacterial pathogenesis who are now generating um, RNA-seq data to map promoters and whatnot. Right? So these are labs that you never would have picked out as being doing next-gen sequencing. But they are because that's what they need to solve their problems. Um, so the problems that my lab's interested in are, are not bioinformatics problems, believe it or not but that we do a lot of bioinformatics to solve the problems that, that come up in our research. And so we're interested in things like cancer, 
um, any type of intestinal bowel diseases, and then uh, infections and how changes in the gut microbiome uh, lead to colonization resistance or colonization sensitivity. Um, another big problem that, that I've already mentioned a couple times is that each of our microbiomes are different. And so um, why is that and who cares, right? So if we all have different gut communities, how does that affect us um, health-wise? And so one of the things I'm very interested in is how, what mechanisms define our microbiome? Why do I have my microbiome and you have yours? And uh, many people get scared by variation, whereas I think the variation is, is pretty cool. Um, and so you can imagine things like genetics. That, you know, we're, not, we're all you know, very similar genomes, but you can just look across the room and just phenotypically you know, say, yeah, we're, we're a bunch of ugly people. Um, varying shades of ugliness. Or, you know. um, uh, we all eat different diets. Uh, some people stayed away from the raw cookies outside. Some people love the raw cookies. Uh, some people, like me, might grab a Big Mac on the way home. Um, you know, this is all going to affect, you might suppose, uh, your microbiome. Your environment matters. Uh, we know that this issue of um, the hygiene hypothesis, that kids that live in the city uh, are very clean environments, tend to have more asthma than kids that uh, grew up eating dirt, um, like my kids. <laughs> uh, and so perhaps environment has some role. Uh, medication, whether or not, you know, you take lots of antibiotics or proton pump inhibitors or any number of drugs you could imagine having an impact on uh, gut community structure. Uh, in our C. diff work with Vince Young and other people on this project, one of the drugs, believe it or not, that we find has a big impact on C. diff susceptibility are antidepressants. Okay? Figure that out. Um, that's a very you know, interesting question. Uh, immunological history. Uh, when we're on prelim committees with students that get the bright idea that they want to do something to do with microbiome project, they propose, always propose doing twin studies. And the immunologist in the room always says, well, genetically they're identical, but immunologically they're not necessarily identical. So what does that do for your twin study? And then life history. Um, how did you come into this world? Well, this kind of gets into mommy wars types of things, where you go vaginal birth versus C-section, bottle fed, breast fed, daycare, not. Um, you know, did you live on a gravel road? Did you live in the city? Uh, and then age. Clearly, you can imagine things at the, the young stage of life uh, being very different, depending on if you're nursing or eating solids. But there's also evidence, perhaps, at the other end of life uh, that the gut community changes as well. And so what I'd like to share with you today are two case studies from our lab. Um, and so these are studies that my lab won't be talking about because these are things I've run with or forced people to do as we're getting the lab up and running. Um, the first is a, a mouse-based study, uh, looking at the stability of the murine gut microbiome, and then looking at the human gut microbiome in uh, humans over uh, a month-long sampling. So I'll first start talking about the mice. And so uh, these are growth curves for 12 mice over 180 days. Uh, we had six males and six females. Uh, don't worry about the coloring or the shading. Uh, they just represent varying uh, litters and cage mates, for our, in our hands at least, that didn't really matter. Uh, we sampled um, daily from these mice, these 12 mice over um, the first 170 days or so post weaning, uh, where you see the black bars at the bottom. Um, these are samples that we then pursued with uh, 16S sequencing, and um, a number of these were also used for metagenomic shotgun sequencing. But we wanted to know, you know, during this early period of rapid growth, is the community less stable than it is later on when you know, growth uh, has slowed down? And so, as I said, we sequence the 16S genes of these communities. Each dot here represents a separate fecal sample um, in gray, and then the colored ones are for these two mice. Uh, the, the red time points are from the first 10 days after weaning, and the blue time points are from 140 to 150 days post weaning. And the black time points are a few time points in between. And what you can see is that um, the communities, uh, in the trees in these individuals early on kind of bounce around. And then something happens where the community shifts and stabilizes. And in this case, the community starts out perhaps looking like its mother. And then on day one, uh, shifts around. Uh, and then something happens again to trigger it uh, to come uh, back to this other side. And 
I don't have the slide, but if you were to color these points by red or blue, uh, basically these points here would all be blue, and these points here would all be red. And so what we, we observed then was that if you look at the, the distance of dissimilarity between samples during this early time period versus the late time period, and compared mice to themselves, that's the solid line, um, that the, the, the early time points, again, zero to nine days post weaning, were less stable or had greater distance between points and between other mice than they did later on. And so later on, uh, the community stabilized um, and had um, much lower day-to-day -day variation and much lower variation uh, between mice. And so this shift occurs to be um, occurring um, with a, a change in the structure of the community. And unfortunately, I have this word diversity. It should be structure uh, with time because although we see this, or stability with time, Although we see the stabilization of the communities, we do not see a change in the diversity of the communities. So you always hear that diversity leads to stability. Well, not in this system. That uh, we saw increased stabilization even though the diversity did not change. Yeah. So, um, great question. <laughs> um, and so we went back and we got um, additional samples between day 10 and 25 to figure out where this tipping point was and colored this heat map each column represents each of the 12 mice. And uh, the blue represent, I switched the colors on you, sorry, um, the early mice, the early time points in the red being more like the later time points. And you can see that about day 11 to 13 is when the communities began to shift. And so it does seem to be a, a pretty quick shift. And another thing that we observed was that uh, some of these mice we took out an additional 200 days to one short of a, a year. Uh, and these communities looked like um, you know, what the communities had looked like 200 days earlier. So the communities became very stable over a long period of time. Um, and so it's interesting to think about, well, what was happening here in days you know, 11 through 15? Um, and one of the things that we observed was that if we look at secretary IgA, which is kind of a surrogate for the immune system, that IgA production ramps up right about the same time. And so whether well, or not this is causal or just correlative, who knows, but it, it at least makes sense that you know, there's a lot of things happening to these mice early in life. They're getting weaned, their immune systems are kicking in. And so it makes sense that uh, those factors would have an effect on shaping their microbiome. Um, we've also gone back and gotten uh, met shotgun metagenomic sequences from many of these time points. And so here um, we've got a correlation of the OTUs, which is just our jargon for species, um, on these rows. And columns represent different uh, protein families. And yellow indicates uh, that these are more tightly correlated with each other. So you can imagine that this rectangle here of yellow and green is correlated with the presence of these species of bacteria. Um, and so this is interesting, but it, in the end, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? That if one bug goes up, you're going to have 4,000 genes go up. If one bug goes down, you're going to have 4,000 genes go down. And so in light of results like this, uh, Matt Jenner in my lab uh, is pursuing, trying to build on this and do things with uh, metatranscriptomics. So not just looking at what genes are there, but what genes are getting expressed. Uh, because it's perhaps informative what genes are present, um, but it's more important what genes are getting expressed. And if Vincent Deneff were here, he'd be saying, ah, who cares about transcriptomics? We should be doing proteomics to see what's actually getting translated um, and going further. So the, the second case study that I want to spend uh, the rest of the time talking about, and most of the time here, uh, is a case study that we did with a family of individuals, uh, humanoids. Um, and this was inspired by uh, experiences with my son sitting out in a pasture. Uh, this is Joe, uh, who's now eight, uh, uh, with two of our ewes. Um, we now, he, Joe now has his own bottle calf that licks him profusely on a regular basis, um, and sheep that uh, crap all over the place. Um, and so thinking about, uh, you know, Joe growing up sitting on a, a pail like this, covered in manure, um, getting used to lick his hand, um, what is that going to do to his microbiome? Versus what happened to my microbiome growing up, um, you know, being the kid of two professors who uh, didn't live in the country. Yeah, watching TV essentially, right? Um, and uh, yeah. And so um, a year and a half ago, uh, our son Jacob was born, and Fred Neidhart, who uh, 
you might consider Mr. E. coli, uh, sent me this very sweet email after uh, we announced that we had a new biological experiment in the lab of a sterile individual being born and getting rapidly colonized. And he said, though the addition of one more individual may host may seem trivial, and though I'm not certain that E. coli needs this incremental addition to its habitat, I rejoice with you and Sarah and Jacob that you have all found each other and will be sharing bacteria and vir viruses for years to come. Uh, and so I thought this was a great hypothesis, right? That we're sharing viruses, and anybody that's a parent, you know, can do armchair epidemiology and basically count the kids uh, and yourselves as you get nor norovirus or rotavirus or colds or whatever going to the family. And so Ruth Lay was lucky enough to find a mom that would uh, help her get stool samples from a newborn infant and herself. Uh, excuse the typo, but uh, this is where the mom's um, stool sample fell out on uh, the day the kid was born. Um, and basically what you see over the first three years of this kid's life, I don't have the times on here, is what we consider to be several stable states. Various states that the kid's gut community experiences where there are shifts in the community structure as the kid goes on to solids and formula, kid be uses antibiotics because of an ear infection, and then recovers from the ear infection and begins to consume an adult diet. Um, and so if you're a parent with young kids, you might worry about graphs like this because you could say, well, man, what if like this kid hadn't gotten this ear infection and gone on these antibiotics? Like, is this kid screwed up for life? And I would say, well, if you're worried about that, we're all screwed up for life because there's all these little coincidences, all these little things that have happened um, across our lives, uh, probably to shape our gut community. And so I was also lucky enough to find a family I was willing to give me crap samples on a regular basis. Um, and so uh, this is a family of eight, uh, which I consider to be an experimental data mine, uh, gold mine. I uh, was a dad that was 35 years old and works outside of the home. Mom was 34. She's a stay-at-home mom. The reason this might be important uh, is because it, ex it limits or at least controls for environmental exposures. Uh, she's mean. In other words, she makes her kids eat her vegetables and do chores and all these other things. Um, they, the six kids, there's two females that are two and ten years old. Uh, the males were zero, four, six, and eight years old, so they're every two years. Uh, they're homeschooled, uh, but they're involved in the community, which means they're all, they're all sharing a very similar environment. Um, very minimal to no history of antibiotics that the parents could recall. And amazingly, in Dece the month of December, no one got sick over the course of 25 days. Um, and so we were able to collect stool samples every day for 25 days. Um, also, as part of a C. diff project, we had 155 samples from healthy individuals, or non-C. diff individuals, uh, in the general Ann Arbor uh, area community uh, as a control. And so the questions that I had in looking at this family are, how stable are the gut communities across short periods of time? Um, people like Ruth Lay and Rob Knight have tracked people over several years, but without intensive sampling over shorter periods of time. Um, in a review, Ruth Lay had this hypothesis or statement that gut community dynamics stabilized with age. I couldn't find any data that was either way on that, so I thought that was an interesting question that we could perhaps test with our chrono sequence of family members. Um, and then also to see if there was a diversity stability relationship building upon the previous mouse work. Uh, and then just to ask this question if a family can act as a chrono sequence. And by chrono sequence, what I mean is uh, people like to go out to volcanoes where they know um, varying age of lava flows. And so they, can, they can say, well, this forest has come up out of a lava flow that occurred 500 years ago. You know, these plants came up out of a lava flow 50 years ago. And they can tell you something about the ecology over time without having to wait 500 years to observe ecology. So could we use the 10-year-old as a surrogate for what the infant might look like uh, 10 years later? And then how clonal or unique is a family's microbiome. Um, do you have the microbiome you have because of the family you are born into, or do you really have your own unique microbiome? Um, and then long-term questions of when does our microbiome become ours? You know, if we're all different, you know, when did Jim Cavicoli get Jim Cavicoli's microbiome? When did Pat Schloss get his? Um, and then how will the family and its members change over time? So if we come back to this family several years later, are they all in the same spot, or have they moved? And then, can we think about using these data to predict disease with the idea of you know, translational or personalized medicine where you, know, you could perhaps send your stool sample to Dr. Young and he could say, hey, Pat, you know, your 
your gut microbiome looks weird. We need to get you in here for a colonoscopy to figure out what's going on. Or we might need to change your diet so this doesn't happen. Uh, that's perhaps the long-term goal of where these types of observations may take us. And so if we looked at the eight individuals, uh, M is for male and F is for female, and the number is their age. And looking at the three most abundant uh, genera of bacteria or species of bacteria in these individuals, we find that for the infant and the two-year-old who are both nursing, the infant was exclusively breastfed and the two-year-old um, was still taking a few sips, um, that, that they both share this bifidobacterium population, um, but that the, the weaned individuals and the parents all were dominated by this species of Lachnosporaceae, um, a Ruminococcaceae, and um, some Clostridiaceae uh, species members. Um, interestingly, uh, there, this um, Lachnosporaceae was found in all eight members of the family, even the infant who was exclusively breastfed. And so it appears that there is some type of family signature and that many of these um, bugs are shared across all family members. Uh, so we we're then interested, well, what do these communities look like? How do these populations change over the month? And so this is the infant, which was dominated by two species of bacteria, um, a, this bifidobacterium and a enterobacteriaceae, the, the E. coli that Fred was talking about. Uh, and so we see this Lotko Volterra, for lack of a better phrase, a type dynamic between these different populations of bacteria. And so this is very intriguing because you might wonder, well, you know, why do we see these large shifts in the community or in the population abundances over time? So Sari Puera, a postdoc in the lab, is digging through um, metagenomic shotgun sequences from these, um, from, uh, these samples from this infant to see if we can identify evidence for phage or things that might clue us in on what, what these bugs might be competing for. This is in contrast to what the father of microbiome looks like. It's a mess, right? It's pretty chaotic. There's many, many different types of bugs going on um, present here. If you look at the infant, you know, these two bugs account for perhaps 95% of all the bacteria in the gut community. Whereas, you know, for the dad, um, there's a lot of um, complexity, a lot of diversity in this community, and a lot of day-to-day -day variation. When we did this type of analysis for all the individuals, um, in parallel with a diet record over the 25 days, we weren't able to identify any real correlations between diet and gut community structure. Um, on the weekends when everyone is eating all meals together, um, you know, on Monday or on Saturday, Sunday or Monday, you wouldn't see the communities looking more similar to each other than they did um, the rest of the week when they weren't sharing all their meals together. Um, if we look at community diversity, the, the complexity of these communities, um, these black dots over here are the, the general community, the Ann Arborites, people coming into the clinic that uh, are relatively healthy. Um, pink are the, the females and the blues are the males. Uh, the infant clearly has a very simple gut community. A uh, two-year-old uh, who, again, is um, who was at the time uh, nursing to some extent, a little bit more complex community. But then everybody else, the, the four children that had been weaned, um, had fairly similar diversity to their community. Um, mom was a bit of an outlier with a pretty high uh, diverse community. Who knows if this was because she just had a baby two months earlier and was breastfeeding. Uh, and dad was um, kind of more of the norm, but perhaps not as diverse a community as the four kids. Um, the next thing we did was what we all love to do, our ordinations, um, and trying to represent this using uh, non-metric non dimensional scaling. Uh, in two dimensions, uh, with the third dimension being time over the course of the month. And so here we have two of the individuals, the infant in blue, who, uh, you know, it's basically a trade-off between E. coli and this bifidobacterium, relatively straight line. And then the two-year-old um, girl, uh, who has, still has a distinct community from the infant. Um, the, the siblings who had been weaned are in these gray dots, and I would color code them for you, but it's a mess. It's a jumble. All four of these weaned siblings um, have very similar gut communities um, over the month, um, yet still distinct from the two-year-old and definitely from the infant. Um, and so, again, these are the sorry, these are the weaned children. Those four weaned children: the pink being the ten-year-old, and then uh, the three other the, uh, three other boys. Again, no matter how you spin this, you can't you can't 
separate the four children from each other. Uh, this is the mother in pink. Uh, the, the father is in blue, but I've tried to rotate this. So you can see that the mother is really distinct from the other children in these gray points. Um, you rotate it so that you see the father more clearly. He's pretty distinct from the children as well as from the mother. The gray points here are the family members' time points in comparison to the wider community. So here again, you see a, a pretty good separation that this family's microbiome is pretty unique to it. Like there are, there are certainly um, people from the general community that cluster within uh, the family's microbiome, but that this family's microbiome is perhaps a variation on its own theme. Yeah, so, so maybe I need to pull out of the community ages and do some age mapping. That's a good point. Um, and so if the ordinations don't convince you, uh, if we go through each of the eight individuals in the family and say, well, if I take you know day five of you know, December 5th, um, which time point of all the other samples in the study were most similar to day five for uh, the infant? And do that for all that individual's time points, uh, the N here in the parentheses is the number of time points we have for each individual in the family. And basically what you find is that for the infant, none of the other time points are anything like um, the infants. And so as you go through, generally what you find is a similar story for the two-year-old. But then when you get to the four, six, eight, and ten-year-old, um, they have very overlapping gut community structures. And that the mom and the dad have unique community structures on their own. Uh, this is interesting to me because uh, people like Jeff Gordon love to use mom as a control group because, for some reason, um, <laughs> people think that the mom uh, has a gut community that's far more similar to uh, her children. Uh, and at least in this case, it seems like there's three different or five different gut community structures going on. Here. And perhaps the father um, has as much to contribute to the gut community as, as mom. The other question we were interested in was community stability. Um, the, the gray line here is a reference from the previous slide where I showed you the mouse day-to-day -day variation, looking at the average distance between days of samples. Uh, the solid blue line is the infant, and the solid, the bolded pink line here is the two-year-old. And then these are all the other time points for the other family members. And so basically what you see uh, is that, you know, we don't really see a stabilization with time, at least over the period between two years and 35 years. Perhaps if we got you know, a 70-year-old and did the same experiment, um, or additional families, we might see something different. But it seems like you know, the community stabilizes or is more um, consistent over time. It would be interesting to say, take this family and hit them with norovirus uh, several times and see how they recover. But I don't think any mom is crazy enough to contribute samples for that study. Um, so questions of like, why do we see so much variation? And so it could be diet. And as I've told you, that similar communities are where you know communities were more similar to each other. They did not um, reflect a similar diet. Sim conversely, similar diets didn't appear to reflect similar communities. Uh, environment uh, doesn't seem to really matter except in the extremes. Um, and this case might be the the infant who um, spends you know most of its time breastfeeding or sleeping far away from six-year-olds that like to wake up infants. Um, and so, you know, you can think that three month, environment of three-month-old is very different than a 35-year-old. And so questions that we're excited about and thinking about this variation and whatnot are things like bacteriophage. Um, hopefully, you know, the infant community is simple enough that we can begin to tease out uh, some information about the phage and see if there are phage active here um, and driving some of these community dynamics. Um, thinking about nutrients and competition for nutrients, um, uh, what's going on there, and perhaps there are bugs producing antibiotics, not you know pharmaceuticals, uh, but being produced by the community to change uh, the landscape of, of who's in the gut community. So we've we've gone back and obtained three uh, shotgun metagenomic libraries from each of the family members, um, from the beginning of the month the middle of the month and the end of the month for all eight individuals. 
And I've coded them again, pink for the females and blue for the males. Uh, D is dad and M is mom. And then the, the number reflects their age. The, I couldn't figure out how to get a two-digit number in R. So this is the 10-year-old with the one. Um, but basically what you see is you see dad, mom, infant, two-year-old, uh, the boys cluster together, and perhaps the 10-year-old girl is beginning to cluster away, um, or, or who knows what. But again, um, if, you, if you do a similar analysis and say what samples are most similar to the other samples, we again see that each individual, at least on these three time points, um, has a gut community that is most like their own, except for when we move into um, the, the children that have been weaned. But there begins to see, um, again, overlap uh, between community structures like we saw uh, with the 16S data. And again, it'll be very interesting to uh, take this forward and see how this family, if they're willing to keep giving samples, um, will, will change their community structures. Um, uh, the 10 year old at this point had already entered puberty and to see if, you know, as she continues to go through puberty, matures, and the boys go through puberty and mature, whether or not they shift to a community structure. Um, you know, all these things, the dynamics of life and understanding how this family's microbiome differentiates. So what? Um, is this just a, a you know, just say so, just say so story, or um, is there more that we can get out of this? And the questions that I raised at the beginning are, you know, are there certain community types? Um, the the popular the, the 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 phrase people have been using are enterotypes, um, and whether or not there are enterotypes is somewhat controversial. But you can imagine that there's different community types where some people are more susceptible to, you know, colonization by certain pathogens. Some are more susceptible to tumor formation um, and so forth. Um, but if we don't understand what gives rise to these community types, um, going back all the way to infancy, then we don't really understand perhaps why we have these community types or what the, the correlations might be. And then you can begin to think about you know, the, the mommy and daddy wars of um, you know, the many ways that we have to screw up our children if screwing up their microbiome is one of the great tools at our disposal to uh, affect our children and our grandchildren, perhaps. And so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the members of my lab, um, people who are working on projects I haven't had a chance to talk about. Neil Baxter and Joe Zakular are working on the cancer project in the lab. Matt Genuer and Alex Schubert are working on the C. diff colonization project, uh, colonization resistant project in the lab. Sarah Westcott and Catherine Iverson are two bioinformatic magicians. Um, Jim Kozik is our uh, lab tech and has been working on protocols to use the MySeq. Uh, Sarah Graznak, who helped us with the sampling protocol. Um, Vince Young. A uh, great collaborator for working on this um, C. diff project. Uh, Simeone Marino is a computational biologist in our department who's been working with me on modeling uh, population dynamics in a, another um, set of experiments we've been doing. Uh, Joe Petrosino is at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, has done a lot of the sequencing for us, uh, and then various funding sources. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you guys might have. you start thinking about all sorts of different metadata that you could collect, I'd actually be really curious. I mean, if they're willing to give you a stool sample every day, just how are they feeling that day? Yeah. Like, are you stressed out today? Did you just get fired from your job? Like, that seems like something that would have potentially massive effects on your gut community. Yeah, and there's, you know, you could, when I, when I teach microbial ecology to, you know, college students, I have them kind of try to go through the day and ask, like, what do you think affected your microbiome today? You know, like, yeah. Washing my hands, I don't know. Like, um, and there's so many things that you could imagine doing that. And so, you know, we know from our studies that you know, if you stress mice, that changes their gut community. And if you do all these myriad of things, it affects their gut community. And trying to figure out, you know, what happens. But what's surprising to me is that over a month, you have all those little perturbations, and for the most part, they're like they were at the beginning. And so. It kind of begins to raise the question of how big of a perturbation do you need to change a community? Does it have to be antibiotics? Or does it have to be, you know, going to Thailand for a week, eating weird food, and then coming back? Or, you know, what, what would it take? So, yeah. Jim. 
Man, you're regular. Morning versus an afternoon. <laughs> yeah, so. whenever they go, they go. Yeah. Um, yeah, like there's, so the, you know, an infant will, will kind of poop on demand. Um, and so that's. And regularly. Know, and, yeah. and, 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 and um, but, you know, they, they weren't super consistent. Um, but one of the things we found was that there were um, some samples for each individual that we got. We got multiple samples per day. And so, and those were just as different as every other sample that we took, except for the infant. Um, so it would appear that kind of the timing in the day may not matter. Um, and, and just to follow up, on, as a technical question, if you take the same stool sample and repeat the experiment three or four times, what's the variance that you see in, in the community variance. structure? Um, it's pretty small. So we typically see on the order of at most like 10%. Yeah, and we've done those painful experiments where you redo everything. The question? Yeah, I, I was um, wondering, the, uh, you're only sampling at the end of the pipe, right? You can't get up further into the intestine and find out what's going on there. Uh, there in, in, in various environments that are not human environments, uh, uh, the um, the details of the biodegradation that take place can be different, but the end, the few, end, but it still all boils down to a few end products. Right. So, you know, in in a, in a sense, I kind of look at the intestine as uh, as like a continuous industrial process for manufacturing something, and things can happen in the in the process. And but if you're only looking at the end of the process, you really don't understand the mechanisms that are going on that produce that, and it all works out to the same thing in the end. Yeah, so so I, I don't I, a, I don't know what to think about that, but I was just wondering if you comment. Yeah, so there's so many caveats in all of this that we know that gut biology changes over the length of the intestine, whether the stomach or the you know, small intestine or the colon. Um, we know that community structure and biology changes. Um, forgive me, you, know, you can think of it as a pipe. You know where you are in the radius of the pipe, whether you're up against the loop. Um, uh, the mucosa or in the lumen or where you are in the lumen because oxygen gradients are going to change. Uh, so yeah, and so the, the hand wavy thing that we use to get out of these lines is to say that you know, the fecal sample is kind of like a general sampling of the whole community. Um, that there might be bugs there that are dead or that aren't active, but at some point it was active. That you don't get this much biomass, microbial biomass, without it doing something somewhere in the gut. Um, and so that's certainly a caveat, and, and we're not going to be able to do colonoscopies on people every day, um, large numbers of people every day, because the colonoscopy itself screws people up. Um, one thing we've thought about doing is perhaps sampling the nares or some part of the oral community to kind of see if different body sites vary differently over time. But um, yeah, oh, yeah, Brett. At the, there's quite a bit of diversity at the phylogenetic level. Do you see that diversity at the functional level and the genomics? I, I guess the, the best way you could answer it to me is, do you get assembly? Yeah, we get assembly. OK. Right, Kath? <laughs> yeah, so and that's a, that's a great question I need to go back and look at, um, kind of the, the number of genes we see in different individuals. Um, my sense is that from looking at the um, like the, the, the community diversity that it's going to be pretty consistent across the lean children and perhaps the adults. Because again, if you have two bugs, you know, the infant, two bugs, you're going to have 8,000 genes, kind of you know, dumb way of thinking of things. And if you have 20, you have 20 times 4,000. So um, perhaps what might be far more exciting um, would be to look at transcript diversity. And are there different types of transcripts getting fired off at different age? Um, and that could be really cool if you've got pre versus post pubescent kids, or mom who's nursing versus some point in her life perhaps not nursing, um, and so forth. But that might be a lot more interesting and definitely more dynamic. Yeah. Cool. So if if the let me let me formulate my thought here. <laughs> so going back to your transcript idea, so like if, if the latency time is only like three to five minutes for that RNA transcript, are you really going to be able to say much towards the diversity of that, of what's happening when it's actively feeding on, say, 
the food source when it's the highest potential for the energy, um, rather when it comes out the tailpipe when it right. everything's been degraded enough, it might be a whole different polymer type transcripts that are being transcribed at that point. So. Yeah, so um, sure, it'll be different, but it'll be something. Um, and I, I guess if you if you look at the transcripts and if it makes sense, that that to be. You know, you've always got to idiot proof it with the biology, and if it makes sense, great. It's measuring something, and I guess perhaps, or it's a model, or it's a sampling of something. We just have to figure out what the something is that we're sampling. So you, so you said there was one OTO, a lactose brachia, that was in all eight individuals, right? And was that the only one that was shared among all of the dominant ones that you saw? Uh, of pretty the much. Ones, yeah. Yeah. So, do you think it's the same one if you were to? Isolate it and do a full genome sequence. You think there was a a dad one and a mom one, and there was a fight amongst the kids over who got what? Yeah. So is that so worth? This a, is a, is a, that a question that's worth anything? Is that a question? That's worth anything? Science, man. Um, <laughs> so um, so we could get at that in the patch loss way, which involves in a culture, and and so we've got metagenomes. These are dominant. One question that I have, and kind of had hoped to get with the mice, perhaps, was you know if you if you look over long periods of time, like say 35 years or 30 days to a microbe, uh, do we see evolution? Do we see populations changing genes and gene frequencies? Teasing that apart from you know the ebbing and flowing of population versus mutations is who knows. Um, so that would be very intriguing. Um, why do we care? I don't know. Like one one question you could ask is, um, you know, if we took mom and dad uh, you know, at year minus fifteen before they knew each other, what did their gut communities look like? And so now what they have is that a mixture of of what they've got. So perhaps we should partner with the dating service and get stool samples from everybody that enrolls and then sample them after they've lived together for a while. We love that. E harmony. That's right. We'll take your crap. So, so, and is it is it an important question? Um, I think that also gets back to you know how do we have the community that you have? Um, I think there are, there are arguments that people kind of select mates based on immune system factors or pheromones or whatever or whatever. Um, you know, I've been around enough dogs and sheep to know they sniff each other's rear ends. Who knows? Um, anything's possible. But um, maybe one more question. Yeah, so I think the, the, the big area that we're all trying to figure out is uh, doing things like multi, what we call multi omics approaches. And so, you know, I've seen your plot, your figure of many levels of complexity, and can we relate what we see at the taxonomic level to gene, to transcript, to protein, to metabolite? Maybe it's going the other direction, and then how that relates to disease. And at what level of scale is important for figuring out things like disease? And my lab's interested in uh, this cancer story as well as colonization resistance. Um, so that's trying to tie it all together. Is, you know, especially if you go up the stack, you know, the time scale is different. Yeah. It has a good model. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we've been um, working with, like I said, Simeone Marino and Denise Kirshner's lab to think about this and keep telling him it's, it's just like gene expression, only it's. Instead of a gene, it's an OTU, it's a species, and it takes some kind of getting used to, but unfortunately, we need more people like that that can think, that can do mathematical and statistical modeling of these processes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.